OK. So yes, uh, I'm Brendan, known on Twitter and other places as Moix. I'm a uh, PhD student at Georgia Tech. Um, you may know me from such previous uh, ill-fated demos as PDB Parse, which is a Python parser for Microsoft PDBs, um, the Volatility Project, where I've written some plugins for that, um, and Panda, which is what this talk is about. Now, of course, um, judging by just purely number of retweets, probably everyone knows me from this instead, which is an ASCII art bear. Um, <laughs> when Heartbleed came out, I wrote a honeypot for it. And when you tried to Heartbleed the honeypot, you got an ASCII art bear. And that was pretty damn popular. So this is the biggest impact I've had on the world. So I'm pretty proud of it. <laughs> All right. But moving on. So uh, what's Panda? So Pat for platform for architecture neutral dynamic analysis. And so, yeah, what's this in less sort of highfalutin terms? Uh, a platform basically just means that you can write plugins, you can extend its functionality. Uh, these take the form of just you know, shared objects you can uh, load. And we've got an API where you can instrument yourself into this dynamic analysis system at various points. Um, it's architecture neutral in the sense that it uh, has been written so that almost everything applies to all of the architectures that Kimu supports. Um, right now, we have essentially full support for everything on x86 and ARM, support for most things on MIPS. And adding new architectures takes about an hour and a half or so. Um, and we're trying to bring that down so we can get all of them supported within you know, the next month or so. Um, we're focusing on dynamic analysis. So you know, we're based on an emulator. We're based on Kimu. Um, this means that we're definitely going to be um, talking about thing code as it runs. And so static analysis is great, but it's also often imprecise and sort of hard to scale um, to large binaries and even whole operating systems. And we really want to do this kind of whole system analysis. So getting down to the features, because there are like a million binary analysis platforms, right? Um, so we're based on Kimu 1.0.1, uh, which granted is about uh, two years old now. But when you compare it with things like um, Timu from Don Song's group, which is still back on Kimu 091, this is much better. You can run Windows 7, um, you know, modern operating systems, and you have a lot of nice features. The really killer feature for Panda is this deterministic record and replay. Um, and I'll be talking a lot more about that in just a minute. But basically, the idea is that you can create very compact traces of execution and replay them later with heavyweight analysis. And you're guaranteed to get the same execution behavior every time you run that replay, because it's going to take all of the non-deterministic inputs and record them, and then make sure that execution follows the same path. Um, so we've shamelessly stolen things that we like. So uh, from S2E, uh, which is a project from EPFL, we've taken the ability to take um, any code that runs on Kimu and lift it up to LLVM bit code. Um, so this may sound like it overlaps with uh, Artem's work um, with the static LLVM lifter, but this is a purely dynamic lifter. So um, you can take any code that's actually running and lift it, but this won't help you, for example, take you know, a whole binary um, and translate it to LLVM. Uh, we've also pulled in um, and heavily rewritten a lot of stuff from the Android emulator. So you can actually run Android um, images inside of Panda and get all of the analysis and record and replay stuff and so on. Um, it's really easy to extend. You know, I've put together most of the demos for this talk by writing some new plugins. Um, you know, plugins tend to be 100, 200 lines, and you can do a lot with them. And so we'll have lots of examples and demo gods willing, uh, even some demos of that. So let's jump in and actually start talking about what record and replay is and how it works. So over here on the left now, you've got your CPU. And you've got a program in some sort of silly CFG representation, right? And you've got various tests at different branches. And what they're going to do is they rely on some sort of external information. So maybe the first one pulls in the current date and time um, and checks if it's Friday. Uh, the next one down is going to uh, actually read a packet. And it's going to check if it's 45. And each time you take one of these branches, you're eliminating other possibilities 
from that path of execution, right? And so now each time you do this, um, you, if you want to be able to reproduce that exact execution, now all you need is the information on the right. And so what this means is that now if you have a system that's architected to capture just that non-deterministic information, you can actually have very compact traces that nevertheless capture everything about the execution. Um, furthermore, once you have these nice compact execution traces, you might actually want to share them. Um, and this is really neat because a lot of results in dynamic analysis particularly are very hard to replicate because you have to get all the same versions of the software, make sure everything is set up just so, run the program with exactly the right inputs, uh, you know, slaughter a chicken, um, <laughs> make sure that everything is working just right, and then maybe you can get the same results as the authors did. With something like record and replay and the ability to share a replay, now what you can do is you can just pull down this replay, run it with the same set of analysis plugins, and you should get exactly the same result. Um, and so I think that's really cool. Um, I think it's great for actually being able to replicate research. So uh, you can just go to rrshare.org, um, you know, log in with Facebook and um, uh, Google, and start uploading and downloading recordings. Um, so the second piece that I, uh, that's pretty big in Panda is this ability to do LLVM translation. Um, so why would you actually want LLVM translation? So I mean, uh, there's already been talks that did LLVM lifting. Uh, but just to refresh the memory, one thing that you want is a common intermediate representation. There's a lot of code out there that already operates on LLVM and can do optimization, uh, data flow analysis, and so on. And so by going into this common intermediate representation, you can take advantage of a lot of that stuff. Um, so what does it actually look like? So over here we've got you know, some classic x86 code. It's a function prolog. Um, you're pushing some stuff. Uh, you know, you're setting some local variables, and you're doing a jump. So first, Kimu itself has its own internal representation for code. And so the first thing that it's going to do is translate this uh, x86 or ARM or whatever code into its own internal format called TCG. Um, now, this is a much less compact representation than x86. x86 is a CISC. It's complex. It has instructions for everything. The TCG IR is designed to have a very small number of operations. So of course, you get a big blow up when you go from x86 into TCG. And you can see that here. So everything up to the end of the slide uh, corresponds to not quite all of that push ESP instruction. Um, so there is quite a blow up. Um, and so now, when you go from there, once you have it in this R, it's actually a fairly direct translation now to go from TCG's IR into LLVM. And so this is the work that the S2E guys did. And we've taken that. We've extended it to support some more uh, new TCG operations, um, fixed a couple of bugs in it, and submitted patches back. Um, and as a result, we can now take any of the architectures that Kimu supports and just lift them up to LLVM. One nice thing is, once you have it in LLVM, you can also do instrumentation on the LLVM code. You can add new functionality to each block. And then, using LLVM's just-in-time compiler, compile that down to native code and actually do the emulation on your instrumented um, LLVM. All right. And there's going to be lots of demos that tie together all these things at the end. So, We've also got Android emulation. Um, this is pretty nice. It supports Android from uh, somewhere in the 2.x range, I think 2.3, all the way up through 4.2. It may support 4.4. I haven't tried it yet. Um, and you can actually do a lot of the things that you can do in the emulator here. You can tell it to make phone calls, uh, send SMS, feed it GPS information, um, all the things you'd be able to do with the em Android emulator. But now you can do this. Um, with some sort of heavyweight analysis from Panda, right? So you could record all of Android system calls. Um, you could take a recording and do some sort of analysis on all the memory accesses going on. Um, we also, again, uh, you know, good artists copy, great artists steal. We took some uh, code from DroidScope that can introspect on the Dolvik virtual machine. So you can actually get information about uh, Dolvik apps as well. So. 
Um, yeah, that's basically the idea behind Android emulation. You can uh, basically the way it works now is you can go and get the Android SDK, create an image in the Android SDK, and then you can convert it over into Panda and just boot it up. Um, the command line is hideously long, but there's an example in the documentation. So I keep talking about Panda as a platform. Panda has plugins and so on. Um, and the basic way this works is it's fairly common to a lot of things you might have seen before, uh, like Pin or uh, Dynamo Rio, something like that, where you have essentially the system as it's executing. At various points, you want to be able to interpose on it. right? You might want to say, every basic block, I'm going to run some code. Every time um, I get an interrupt, I want to do something else. You know, this sort of thing. So in particular, um, the best way to understand uh, the various kinds of places you can hook in is to look at the process by which guest code uh, running inside a virtual machine gets translated into stuff that's going to run on the host um, in Kimu. Right, so you start out with guest code. Right? This might be you know, a Windows 7 VM running in Kimu. Uh, it might be the Android, uh, you know, the Android image, um, anything else. So the first thing that Kimu is going to do is it's going to translate that into its TCGIR. Um, and so before you translate, you might want to uh, hook in and say, OK, I actually want to step in here and modify the translation process. Um, I might just want to log the fact that this bit of code is about to be translated, something like that. Um, you can also, at this point, say, oh, OK, I want to know that this individual instruction is going to be translated. Um, finally, once it's been translated, you can say, OK, now after this has been translated, I also want to know. right? Um, finally, once it's been translated and it's actually running, you can interpose um, at each basic block, before and after. Inside of a given basic block, you can look at things like virtual and physical memory reads. Uh, you can also interpose on individual instructions as they execute. Um, and there's also support for what we're calling an in-guest hypercall. So you can, uh, there's a special instruction uh, where if you run it inside of a program, it triggers an explicit notification. So this is nice where you want to run something from inside the OS that actually cooperates with the outside. So for example, we can use this um, when we're in the guest if, say, you want to turn on uh, dynamic taint flow analysis, um, which is another feature of Panda that I'll be demoing. Um, and if you want to turn on taint flow analysis, you can say, OK, label uh, this buffer this many bytes with uh, these labels. And that will trigger this notification now to a Panda plugin that can turn on taint, um, apply the taint labels to that buffer, and start tracking it as it goes through execution. So there are actually even more than the ones that I just listed on that you know, impressively complicated slide. Um, so you can do hard drive read and writes, network packet send and receive. Um, when the base address for address translation changes, which usually means that you change, switch to a new process context, um, and also when you start a replay. So uh, yeah, so I've talked a lot. What can you actually like do with this thing? Uh, so I figured that the best way uh, to tell about it is actually just a show. So. We're going to be walking through three different cases. Um, we're going to use dynamic taint analysis uh, to analyze a backdoored SSH keygen. And this isn't actually something we found in the wild. We just took the SSH keygen source code and hacked it up to uh, exfiltrate some data. Um, I'm going to break some Spotify DRM. Um, so hopefully that'll be fun. That's why I've got audio hooked up here. Um, and then we're going to do some live memory visualization using the uh, Hilbert curve and talk about all of these in detail. OK. So let's start with the first one. So the scenario here is someone has rooted your system, and they want to be able to get access to your SSH keys. So they're going to SSH, uh, backdoor SSH key gen so that now, whenever you generate a new key, it's going to take the passphrase, it's going to take the uh, private key, and it's going to send them off to some host. 
Um, and so the way we're going to analyze it is you take a recording of SSH keygen, um, and then you run the replay, and you taint the passphrase. Right? So taint analysis, of course, uh, lets you track long-range data flows between some source and some destination. And so the passphrase here is our source. We want to know if that passphrase ever gets sent out on the network, because that would be bad. Passphrases are not supposed to leave your own machine. They're just supposed to be used to decrypt the private key. Um, and so if we see tainted data ending up in send, we know that's a very bad thing, right? So uh, just to show off, you know, it's not the most subtle of, uh, definitely not the most subtle backdoor. You can see down there the mwahaha leak the passphrase. So um, that's when you try to input a passphrase. When it actually goes to save the private key, again, it's going to uh, leak the private key and send it out. OK. So now, the exciting part. Um, <laughs> I have pre-prepared um, the good. So I've pre-prepared um, a recording that has the SSH key gen, and we typed in the password um, ultimate frisbee. So now there is a hideously long command line that we're going to run. Um, and I'll explain all the different parts of it, right? So we're based on Kimu. So of course, the first thing we do is we're running um, Kimu system x86-64. This is the whole system emulator portion of Kimu on the x86-64 platform. We're doing a replay of this SSH backdoor 32 uh, record and replay log. And then we've got a bunch of plugins, and I'll talk about those in detail um, on some slides in a second. So this takes a little while to execute, so I'm going to get it started. Um, and you can see it's you know, outputting a whole bunch of stuff. And what it's doing is it's going to be looking for, can it, also, is this visible? OK. <laughs> um, it's going to be looking for anywhere in memory that this uh, passphrase is used. So it's looking for ultimate frisbee. And when it sees it, it's going to taint it. So anywhere that it's used um, in any part of the operating system, user land code, it's going to taint it. Um, and then when syscalls happen, it's going to actually check for whether that's the send syscall and query taint on the data going out. And if it's tainted with anything derived from the passphrase, we'll know about it. So going back to some slides. OK. Um, so yeah, I said before we had this ridiculous command line. Um, and the trickiest thing is that we've got five different plugins at play here. And so in Panda, uh, you can, of course, load multiple plugins at a time. They'll all get notified when events of interest happened. Um, and they can also talk to one another. They can load functions in one another. So you can have callbacks within a plugin as well. So in this case, OK, so we've got this call stack plugin, what this is doing is it's keeping track of calling contexts. Um, so it keeps up to 15 levels of call stack information um, for every program in the system. Um, so that can also have callbacks registered inside it, so you can get notified when a function's called, when a function returns, and you can then get access to things like the arguments, the return value. Um, this next one is just a basic sort of syscall tracer. Um, We've modified it from its uh, default version for this demo so that it explicitly looks for the send one. And when it sees send, it's going to query taint. Um, this next one is string search. What it's doing is it's looking at every memory access, and it's trying to see if a certain string is passing through um, at any of these points. Uh, finally, if it does see that, it's going to apply taint to the passphrase. And finally, the taint engine um, is going to be responsible for propagating the tainted data through all of uh, the code that's running. OK. So let's talk about each of the steps in detail, right? So um, how do we actually go through and find out where this passphrase is being used? You know, it, um, We know that, for example, it's going to be in the keyboard driver, because you're going to type in the passphrase initially. Um, but we also know that it's going to be copied around a bunch of different buffers within SSH keygen and so on. So what we want to do is find places in the system where 
some data of interest is being handled, right? And so uh, to do this, what we're going to do is something that sounds honestly kind of stupid to start with, <laughs> which is we're going to just intercept every single memory access in the system. I mean, you thought that you know having to hit disk uh, when you wanted to access memory was bad. This is this is worse. Every time you access a single byte, you're going to actually run some code, do some computation, and do something to figure out whether the data you care about is there. And the only reason this is actually possible at all is that we have record and replay, right? So no matter how much time we spend on every memory access, you're not going to perturb the system. You're not going to get network tech connections timing out. Um, you're not going to have you know, hard disk reads failing, and so on. And this is really important because you don't want um, to perturb the system at all. You really want to just be able to take a recording at something close to normal speed and then be able to go over it later with these really heavyweight kind of memory analyses. So these sort of points of interest um, that we want to hook into are what we're going to call tap points, because they're just places where you can hook in, see data streaming by, um, and then see if that data is interesting. Um, and there's lot, lots of details in uh, a paper that we did for ACM CCS, uh, which still qualifies for, I think, the worst pun I've ever made in an academic paper. It is uh, Tappan Zee North Bridge, because, <laughs> um, of course, you are tapping the North Bridge, which carried memory accesses up until, like, the last couple CPU architectures. Anyway, and the Tappan Zee Bridge, of course, is in New York. I'm sure this plays better in New York. Anyway. <laughs> so, all right, what do tap points actually look like? So, first of all, um, we've got some code that's running on the right. And in the middle, we've got the corresponding tap point. So this code is um, actually a snippet from the Windows 7 uh, file opening code. And these tap points uh, consist of three pieces which are the calling function, the current program counter, and the address space that we're in. So in this case, we're all in the kernel because um, you know, the Windows file system code uh, is in the kernel. So as we go through and execute, we're going to log the reads and writes over on the left, right? And look at what the content of them is. So you, know, you push something, that's the content of EBX, not that interesting. Uh, likewise, we're just going to push some stuff. You get a read and a write there because you're reading from memory and then you're pushing it onto the stack. So that's both a read and a write at that one tap point. Uh, moving on, you know, you push ESI. When you call memcopy, you push the return address. And now you get something that's actually maybe a little bit more interesting. Here you've got a rep move SD, which is actually implementing the core of the memcopy. And now if you look at the content going through there, you actually have something that corresponds to the file path. So if you have a way to sit at all these tap points and look at the content going through, now you can actually start to find out interesting things about what's going on in the system. And so that's how we're going to do uh, this finding the uh, passphrase that we put into SSH keygen. All right. So um, now, of course, there's lots of other stuff going on in the system, lots of other junk data going through the tap points that maybe you don't care about. Um, and so what we do instead now is have a plugin um, that's going to do simple string matching at every tap point, right? So as the data comes through, it's just going to match it byte by byte to the fixed string that we're looking for. So um, the way this is implemented is using a panda callback. Uh, we're getting a callback every time there's a physical memory read or write. We're getting the caller, program counter, and address space. Um, and the caller is coming from that call stack plugin I mentioned. And so we're just going to look at the data flowing through that tap point. Um, and when we find it, we're going to taint that data. So how do we actually taint that data? So uh, you can taint this. So dynamic taint analysis is a really old technique. Uh, I think it goes back at least to the 70s, possibly earlier. Um, and what you do is you're just trying to follow data flow from some taint source, which is some place where you've decided that this is sensitive information. I want to see where it ends up. And then any operation on that tainted data um, can propagate the taint forward. So if you copy tainted data into a new memory location, if you multiply it by two and move it somewhere else, 
Um, if you combine it with some other untainted source, you might want the result to still be tainted. And so all of these things will propagate taint as the CPU executes. And so in Pando, we do this as an LLVM pass. So when you're uh, running the OS, you can have Panda translate things into LLVM. And now I said that you could instrument the LLVM code. So one thing that you can do um, is you can take the LLVM code and walk over and add these taint operations to it. So instead of just executing now, you're also going to execute and emit um, sort of a set of instructions that say how taint is supposed to be pop propagated through these basic blocks. And we're also going to log a bit of um, dynamic information at the same time. Um, I want to mention here at this point that this is all the work of this fine man right here, Ryan Whelan in the front row, um, who did this LVM-based uh, taint analysis. So the really cool thing about doing this in LVM is that this means that on any platform that Panda supports, we can potentially get taint analysis, right? Because if it's just implemented on top of LVM, now we don't have to do anything extra to support, say, um, MIPS taint analysis or Spark taint analysis. The other thing that um, you can do, given that it's LVM and LVM includes a C compiler, is that there are portions of Kimu um, that don't use TCG for uh, even though they're doing emulation. So, for example, floating point operations um, are just implemented as C functions. So, um, if you're doing a taint analysis just on the TCG information, you would miss code uh, that uses the FPU and that potentially propagates tainted data through the FPU. But what we can do, um, since we're using LLVM, is we can compile all of the helpers to LLVM bit code. And now we have the same internal representation for the C code portions and the um, emulated guest code portions. And so we can track taint through all of those as well. And so that's pretty cool. And that's actually something uh, that is unique to Panda and isn't found anywhere else. Um, so just to represent this all pictorially, again, we have this familiar situation. You've got guest code. It's translated into TCG. Um, it's then lifted from TCG to LVM. We instrument the LVM IR so that it also emits taint operations as it's running. And so now when it's actually running, um, the native code that's running on the host is going to emit both taint operations and dynamic values that you need um, to do things like resolve uh, pointer locations. And all that's going to go into a taint processor that's going to keep an updated um, idea of what memory is tainted, what values are tainted, so that now at any point you can query the taint processor and say, is this chunk of memory, does it have any labels on it? And if so, what are the labels? So by now our, um, yes, our key gen demo should have finished. So let's go look through what it did. Um, let's see. So in particular, um, we can see that one thing that it's done is it's noticed that there was some tainted data going out on the network. And it was labeled with all 15 bytes of our passphrase. So this is because, of course, if you decrypt um, the private key, um, the decrypted data is going to be tainted with um, your passphrase. And, and so now we're actually dumping out what the tainted data was. And we can see it's this end RSA private key. Um, so it is, in fact, exfiltrating your private key out on the network. Uh, let's see if we can go back to any of the previous stuff. Um, so it looks like most of this is, in fact, exfiltrating the private key. Um, but a little bit further up, let's see if I can go back to a uh, previous one. Yeah. So in this log, we can see that there's a, there was a write match at a certain tap point. Um, it checked the string. It was the passphrase we were looking for. And so now it's turning on taint um, and tainting that value. And moving forward, um, let's see what else we have. OK, so we've got some socket calls. 
before that looks like they weren't sending out tainted data. Uh, but then down, once you get down here, you've got, um, again, the passphrase that we saw going out on the network. And it was tainted um, with all of the labels you'd expect, right? So the first byte was tainted with the first um, labeled byte of the passphrase, because it's just a copy of the passphrase going out on the network. So, um, right. So if you were using it as some sort of real world scenario, of course, you wouldn't necessarily know a priori that um, it was going to exfiltrate your data. Um, one thing you could do is you could just taint all keyboard input. And if, for example, it's an app that you know is not supposed to be exfiltrating your keystrokes, any evidence that your keystrokes were going out on the network would be a bad thing. Um, you could also taint private data. You know, if you have your address book, um, you could taint that and then uh, wait for it to go out on the network. And now you'll be able to see who's trying to use your private information. Um, so, you know, taint analysis is a pretty cool and useful thing. Um, it can form the basis of a lot of other analyses. So if any of you saw the um, Sage Fuzzer talk yesterday, one of the things that depended on was being able to track taint um, so that you could build up these symbolic expressions. So you could use something like this taint system as a basis for that, too. All right. So let's keep going. All right. So everyone knows Spotify. Um, it's a streaming music service. And uh, of course, when they give you these files, they initially come down over the network, and they're encrypted. And I think specifically they're encrypted um, with AES with a different key for each song. So how are we actually going to uh, try and break this? So we're not going to, for example, try to find the specific key or the key derivation mechanism for each song. Uh, what we're going to do is something uh, sort of much simpler and much cruder, uh, but still effective. So what's interesting about many types of DRM is it has actually a fairly strong signature. So encrypted data has very high byte entropy and very high randomness. It's supposed to be indistinguishable from random data. By contrast, things like music files, they still have high byte entropy, but they aren't actually very random. They're fairly structured. And so there's a statistical test for randomness called the chi-squared test that you can use to evaluate the randomness of something. And so uh, this was first pointed out, as far as I know, in a paper called Steal This Movie that was presented at Usenix last year. Um, and so I read this, and they went through, and they did a lot of really like hardcore optimization so they could get this thing to run in real time on someone's system. Um, I said, yeah, that's really cool that you guys did that, but I'm super lazy. I don't want to do all that optimization, and I have record and replay. So um, the reason they needed to optimize it is that you have DRM platforms, and like anything else, they're going to use some anti-debugging techniques. You know, they aren't going to like it if you take you know, 10 seconds to go from one instruction to the next. They aren't going to like it, um, you know, in particular, Spotify, I think, is also packed. Um, and all these other things. And of course, many of them are also streaming services. So if you take too long to uh, send an ACK back to the network server, you're going to drop the connection. So we can get around all this by just taking a recording of Spotify. So we can fire up a VM, uh, put in Spotify, start playing a song, hit record. And now we're going to have a recording of all of the code that gets executed as Spotify decrypts and plays this song. So now, of course, we can go through with the plugins um, that we've talked about and some new ones. And we can actually calculate the entropy and randomness of all of the data streams passing through these tap points that we talked about. And so what we're going to be looking for is some function that reads in this high entropy high randomness data and writes out high entropy but low randomness data. And that's going to be the uh, decrypted but not decompressed song. And this will be really nice, because that's what we really want. You know, We want to get an MP3 or an AUG out of this. We don't want to get a WAV file that we have to re-encode. OK. So uh, the nice thing is that you can 
basically compute one set of summary statistics for all of these streams. So this is just a basic histogram, right? Um, along the bottom, you've got the byte value. And along the y-axis, you've got the count of each byte. And that's all you need to calculate both entropy and this uh, Pearson's chi-squared test. So let's go to the demo. Um, so first of all, I just want to show there's a tool called ENT, which is used for evaluating the entropy of different streams. And so I've got uh, a sample MP3 over here. And we can calculate um, its entropy and randomness. And so the ENT tool is used to, say, take a stream of random numbers that you want to use for your random number generator and just do some basic tests to say, does this look OK? OK. And so um, right here, the chi-squared for um, an MP3 is pretty high. And if it were actually random, um, you'd only see it exceed this value 0.01% of times, right? That's not very good. Um, that's not very random at all. By contrast, if we take one that I've encrypted using uh, AES-CBC and a not very good passphrase, um, even so, we can see that now the chi-squared value is actually pretty low. And it's pretty likely that you would see this uh, pattern of bytes in a random stream. And likewise, at the same time, if you look at the entropy, they're both very similar, you know, somewhere between uh, 7.9 and 8, right? So they're both, they both have pretty high entropy. One has low randomness. And so this is the signal that we're going to use to pick out the stream of data that we actually care about. So how do we actually do that? Um, so we can go over to here. And again, I took a uh, recording earlier of Spotify. Um, unfortunately, I am not going to take it again, but I did record a movie of it. Um, so CBLC. Let's see if this works. Um, and so you can see we're playing uh, one of my favorite songs over here. Um, <laughs> So now we've got this recording. Um, and that movie was actually taken uh, after the fact. When you're running a replay, you can take screenshots at various points and reconstruct a movie. Um, so we can actually see what was going on on the screen. OK. So now we've got um, our recording. We want to go through now and see if we can find um, this DRM signal. So as I said, we want to compute a histogram. So what we're going to do is um, Spotify. Is so we're going to do a replay of Spotify. We're going to add a Panda plugin. And they're all stored in x 64 soft MMU. Um, Panda plugins. And the first one we're going to do is the call stack plugin, because that's, again, what's keeping track of all of our uh, call chains and what's going to uh, tell us, essentially, what our calling context is. Uh, the next one I'm going to add in is the Unigrams plugin. Um, and what this one does is, for each of these uh, calling context EIP address space triples, um, it's going to compute a histogram of the bytes that go through it. Right? Um, so doo -doo -doo. of course, the Demo gods, once again, are unkind. Um, Panda plugin. There we go. Uh, yeah, there's dot .so. That's one problem. And the other one is that I used an underscore instead of a dash. Um, Panda call stack. Right? OK. And so we can run through this. Um, this is actually a fairly large replay. Uh, it's about 12 billion instructions. Um, and it takes around 12 minutes to run. Um, I don't want to wait that long. So we're going to do this sort of cooking show style. Um, and I'm going to switch over to here, where um, I've already got the outputs of that. So 
It produces two files, this Unigram mem read report and Unigram mem write report. And for each of these, you've got uh, that triple, and then you've just got um, 256 ints representing the counts that were observed for each byte at that point, right? Basic histogram. Um, and then we've got a script called find DRM that's going to run on those two. And what it does is um, it's going to load the two files um, and then just calculate using um, NumPy and SciPy the appropriate statistical test and entropy. Um, and so when I did this at home on a different laptop, it took about 30 seconds. So we'll see how it does now. Um, so again, you know, we're going to be using some other things too. Um, in particular, we're going to say, well, if it's doing decryption, um, probably the input and the output size is going to be about the same. Um, and so we're going to use that. Also, if you're decrypting an MP3 file, um, you know, say we did that, the recording, I played the song for about 30 seconds. So we're probably going to be looking at somewhere on the order of 500K, 700K or so um, at, you know, MP3-ish encryption rates, right? Or uh, encoding rates. And so, OK, here is the output of that. And OK, so the first thing that we're doing is um, we're just going to take all of the um, points that qualified and list what the sizes were, um, all the writes, all the reads. And then further down in the output, um, we're going to start looking at what the actual uh, chi-squared values for each buffer were. Um, and so again, we're looking for ones that had very random input and not very random output. Um, and happily, for demonstration purposes, um, the best candidate ends up being the last one that's printed, um, which is this one down here, um, which is you know the function that was called was at this address, and it was in this process. Um, and so now, if you wanted to, you could also, for example, uh, take a memory dump um, from this replay. So you can do the replay, and while it's replaying, you can take a memory snapshot, analyze it with any of your favorite tools, um, like volatility, um, convert it to a crash dump, and throw it up into WinDBG, um, extract the process out, and look at um, the actual Spotify binary in IDA. Um, and if you go to that location, you'll see that it's calling um, it's calling a function that actually, in fact, does do the decryption of the song. Um, but suppose that we didn't want to do any of that, and we just wanted to have some sort of quick, high-level verification as to whether this worked. Um, so one thing that we could do is, so now we think that, when this, that the output of this function is a decrypted buffer, right? So um, what I'm going to do is, Go back up to where we um, to our write buffers, and right. And so this is the full tap point, right? At this instruction um, in the function called from this call site in this process, um, we wrote about 700k, and that's going to be our candidate for what the decrypted sound is. Okay. So um, now, if we were to go back into Panda, um, look through our Panda plugins, what do we have? OK. So the one that we want to use for this uh, is called Tap Dump. It takes in that nice uh, three tuple, um, and it just dumps all the data out, right? OK. So can set it up. Um, in this case, you know, I already do this, so it's going to be the same one. And now we could do that replay again, but instead of unigrams, we're going to do tap dump, right? OK. And so that's all cool. It's going to load the snapshot. It's out of the tap point. And for now, for every byte that comes through there, it's going to log that byte to a file. Okay. Once again, this takes about 12 minutes. 
I'm not going to sit through that. Um, OK. So in here, we've got the result of it. If we look at the stuff that was written, um, we've got all of the calling context information in case we need to make it more restrictive than just one level of calling context. Right? Context is good. More context is sometimes better. On the far right, we've got the actual bytes. Um, and if anyone happens to know what these are, um, it turns out to be OGGS, which is the uh, magic number for an AUG stream. So looks like we found it. Um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, take a script that um, takes that giant file and actually just pulls out the bytes um, so that you get a raw binary file, right? OK, so, and we're just going to call it Spotify. And in a moment, it should uh, give us a file, which is this. OK. OK, so good sign so far. Um, so we actually did dump out the data that was passing through this. And this was just um, a, I believe that if you look at the instruction, it was just um, a final XOR instruction um, for the key stream against the encrypted data. So OK, um, this is good. Do we want to actually listen to it and see if it is what we thought it was? Yes, we do. Of course we do. OK. Um, all right. This is the tough part. All right, we got a good sound level. Okay. All right, I won't make you listen to any more of that. <laughs> but just let, to let you know, you know. You may think that you have it bad having to listen to it now. I listened to that like 20 times while I was making this demo, and every time I practiced the slides, it got stuck in my head again. So <laughs> all right, so that's how you can use Panda to break Spotify DRM. Now, of course, if you want to make this into like a general purpose procedure that can just rip Spotify tracks, what you would do is you would take um, those three bits of information, the caller, the program counter, and the process, and that would tell you where to insert a hook. Um, so now you could hook into the process and dump out anything that was coming through there. right? So that would give you a general purpose uh, extractor. Uh, so also, does anyone know Canadian law? Did I just violate uh, some Canadian equivalent of the DMCA? Yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> all right, well, let's get back to it. Looks like we're starting to run through our time. OK, so the last thing, um, everyone loves visualizations. They're pretty. Um, if you put on some pounding techno music while you're playing them, uh, you can often get some good visuals for a rave. Um, so what we're going to be uh, looking at is doing live memory write visualization using the Hilbert curve. So the Hilbert curve is a uh, space filling curve that basically uh, takes a long one-dimensional linear space and it folds it up into two dimensions. And if you were to just do this in the naive way by sort of rastering across, what would happen is that you'd get two bytes that are very far away, you get two things that are very far away from each other in 2D space that were originally quite close to each other in one dimensional space. And so the Hilbert curve is an attempt uh, to get around that. So if you look in the bottom left, you can see um, the Hilbert curve at various levels of granularity. And because of the way that it curls and folds in on itself, it's very likely that if you have two things that were originally close by in your one-dimensional space, they're now going to be close together in your two-dimensional space. And so um, I got this idea from uh, Aldo Cortese, who uh, did this for binaries. And essentially, you get these cool sort of blocky patterns um, that are then colored by the byte value at that point. And so 
um, assuming he's using the same color mapping I am, uh, I think I can see some text in there. Uh, you know, there's some, you know, I don't see any executable code, but uh, no. <laughs> I, I just made all that up. Um, <laughs> so what we're going to be doing uh, is we're going to boot a MIPS router image. Um, and we're going to watch the memory writes using a Hilbert space filling curve. Um, and we're going to see what we see. Uh, so this is basically intended to show off, A, you know, you can write some, you know, weird analysis plugins for Panda. Um, you can write them on weird architectures. Um, I guess MIPS isn't that weird, but. Um, and, you know, so uh, putting this plugin together took I guess about a day. Um, I hadn't used SDL before, so I had to go learn that. Um, but at the end of it, we get something like this. Um, and so here we're going to, I hope, yeah, we're going to uh, create um, our window. And down there in the bottom left of this uh, Hilbert window, we've got um, some raw bytes. Now, uh, if you're running a live system and every time you read or write a byte, you're going to go and put a pixel on screen and change its value, uh, that's also going to be pretty slow. Um, so I've put in some hotkeys for temporarily disabling the visualization so that you can fast forward. So okay, now on the left you can see that uh, this little MIPS router is going through its boot up sequence. Um, we've got some exciting uh, patterns appearing over in the uh, Hilbert visualization. Um, and, you know, we're starting to boot up. Uh, let's keep going a little bit more. Um, okay. And so now we've actually got some stuff going on in the center of the screen uh, that you can actually see. The, um, so, again, you can see this is not very fast. Each of these represents the right of one byte. And so if you can see them going by, you're not getting very good throughput. Um, <laughs> but what this does let us do is at different points in execution, we can go through now and say, um, okay, you know, what is all of this blue stuff? Um, and so by clicking on the window, you can uh, get a view into memory of what's going on at that point. Um, and so here, let's see, allow signal, uh, Jiffy 64 to clock. It looks like these might be some kernel symbols. Um, up here, uh, it looks like we've got a pointer table. Um, so MIPS is a little endian, and so you know you get these bytes here uh, backwards are something some sort of kernel address. Uh, let's go back. Um, so you can keep on fast forwarding, and eventually we get a little bit further in the boot process. Um, all of these things you know are weird patterns. To be honest, I have no clue how this would actually be useful for reverse engineering. <laughs> um, what it has taught me over a few hours of screwing around with it um, is that there is a bunch of weird shit in memory. Um, <laughs> we, can, uh, we can pan around and uh, you know, pause simulation for a bit, see what we see. Um, looks like that might be a bit of a MAC address. Um, just very strange stuff that you'll find here. This nice green field just the endlessly repeating pattern 2007. Why not? Um, <laughs> so uh, you can also temporarily disable visualization um, and let the thing actually boot up uh, to the BusyBox console. Um, if any of you have used uh, OpenWRT, um, you can eventually get a shell on this thing. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, this is essentially just a silly demo. It's uh, something that you might want to use to say, what's that weird thing in memory? I'll click on it, I'll look at its contents. Maybe if I can get an address, I can map that back to, actual, to some actual data structure. Maybe there's some really good reason for a bunch of 2007s to be in memory. Um, who knows, maybe it's part of the graphics stack and you know, that's part of a cursor or something like that with a big contiguous region of color. Um, okay. So yeah, we can press enter to activate that console. We can get our obligatory uh, mixed drink recipe. Um, <laughs> and so I think I'm going to call that one a demo. Um, you know, there's not too much more uh, 
to be seen here. I mean, there's all of memory to be seen, uh, but it's hard to say in advance exactly what um, might be cool. OK. So let's wrap this up, because I have a power for thirst, and I'm going to go drinking. Um, all right. So how do you actually like go get started? So we've got a GitHub page. Um, everything in this demo is currently online. You can go download it. You can run the demo. You can uh, put on the techno music and watch that visualization. Um, we've also got a pre-built VM. Uh, it's a little bit out of date, and I need to refresh it. Um, but it'll get you started. It's a VirtualBox VM that you can just uh, start running and start running your own VMs inside VMs, doing recordings, doing replays, uh, running plugins, all of this. Um, we've also actually got some documentation, which was a weird feeling for me. I, I don't usually do that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we've got some documentation, um, which tells you about how record and replay works, tells you about how to get the Android stuff uh, up and running, and describes the basic API. Um, you can also go on rrshare.org, uh, pull down some replays, um, and start doing some analysis. We've got some fun ones up there. Uh, we've got an example of the uh, shell code that the FBI used to exploit uh, Tor's freedom hosting users. So if you want to uh, run that shell code, do some analysis on it, now you can actually get the replay um, and apply whatever analyses you want to that uh, running code. So uh, finally, I just want to give some credits here. Uh, Panda is not just me. Uh, it's the work of a bunch of people. Um, Tim Leake, Josh Hodosh, Ryan Whelan, and Andy Davis at uh, Lincoln Lab. Probably some others that I forgot about, and I'm so sorry. Um, and Sam Coe at Northeastern University. So, uh, you know, get in touch. Uh, there's lots of ways you can do it. I'm on Twitter. I've got email. Uh, we've got a user's mailing list that you can subscribe to and ask questions like, why the fuck doesn't this work? Uh, I'm much the, our favorite way uh, for you to contribute and for you to uh, get in touch with us is via a pull request. Um, so if you add code, uh, you know, give us a pull request. Hopefully we can integrate it. And uh, yeah, go forth and analyze dynamically. Anyone got questions? Oh. You were not chosen. <laughs> Could you uh, technically take the uh, replay data and then uh, save the LLVM bit code that gets executed from point A to point B, save it to a BC file, instrument it, change the values, optimize it out, and then perform some analysis and maybe get a optimized binary out of the decryption routine of a process, for example? Yes. So uh, yes, if you were to take the uh, bit code, put it all into one module, and dump it out, you could then do extra instrumentation and analysis. Um, this wouldn't be as good as having a real binary. Um, for one thing, because the bit code that we generate uh, has a lot of Kimu internal stuff uh, sprinkled in. Um, but if you were to strip that out, you can actually do pretty well. Um, the bigger problem would be the fact that uh, you're only getting a dynamic execution. So you're only getting a certain path through that program, um, which means that unless you have really, really good code coverage, you won't get a complete binary back from it. Um, but you can absolutely do dump it out for uh, some analysis from offline analysis later. Okay. Um, one example that I've uh, done is uh, essentially dumping out the LVM bit code, um, and then we hacked up the CLI symbolic execution uh, system. And we were able to do symbolic execution over that um, static bitcode file um, and you know, find out some information about uh, possible ranges for inputs, generate path constraints, and so on. So yes, it's possible. It can Great. be done. Thanks. I think there was a guy over here that had a question. Oh, so many people with questions. It's amazing. Thank you. Hi. Uh, amazing work. Thanks a lot for that, for your presentation. It was very good. Um, I have a question regarding the timeliness. Uh, you, um, you showed that the, the SSH keygen took around four minutes to run. 
Yes. Um, and then you were referring to tracking private data from the address book, et cetera, et cetera. So in practice, you would want to have that run basically in real time. Um, do you see that happening anytime soon or with, I don't know, what, what kind of techniques? I, right. I guess you can so, optimize quite a bit. Um, we probably aren't going to have, uh, say, online taint analysis. Um, you know, the LLVM instrumentation method is great because it essentially uh, lets you, you know, do it in a very generic way, but it's not very fast at all. Um, for reference, I think the fastest online uh, taint analysis system for Kimu right now um, is one that's being presented at uh, ISTA this year, and it has about 600% overhead. So it's only six times, um, yeah. which is still not quite in the realm of usable, um, in my opinion. But um, so online taint analysis is much harder. Um, you know, currently the way we would say to do that is um, taking a recording is actually pretty low overhead. Um, it's somewhere around 2x over uh, native. So um, you could just take a recording of, you know, you browsing a session, I don't know, visiting some sketchy websites, um, and so on, and then you could do the analysis on the recording. Yeah. Uh, just a technical question. Um, yes. How, um, how, many, how, how big was your taint space? How many bits, taint bits did you have? Ah, the, so the taint is, uh, sorry, the question was uh, how big is the taint, or? Yeah. Okay, um, so we were just tainting the passphrase in that demo. Um, it was a 15 character passphrase, we do byte okay. level taint. I mean, I mean oh. in general, in your architecture. Oh, um, I'm gonna actually ask Ryan to answer you that question because he developed it. This is awkward. <laughs> Um, so do you mean in terms of space overhead, like how much, okay, so we, the, the architecture of the, the shadow memory is actually uh, page based, so memory only gets allocated when taint gets put somewhere. So it's a pretty, it's pretty lightweight in the general case when you don't have too much taint going around, but obviously taint explosion can blow that up. Yeah, I think, um, most of the time, it's it's you generally see like a a, a page based structure, um, some of the most common systems. So, yeah. Okay, you guys can you know get a room. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Was there anyone else? I thought I saw a hand in the back. I'm keeping people from coffee, aren't I? <laughs> so my question is, you state that you record information on non-deterministic behavior so that you can replay things reproducible. And uh, the, how low level does that go? For example, if you have a hard drive with an intermittent bad sector, is it going to record that the drive failed to read if you have a binary in your system that's doing a cache timing attack against another binary in the same VM, are you going to be able to get that timing information? Yes, as long as you can uh, run the, uh, as long as you can get that timing at record time, you can reproduce the exact thing um, at replay time. Because essentially, um, at replay time, the non-deterministic events are injected not based on the clock time, but based on um, how many instructions have been executed. So you can always put them exactly into the right place um, when, when you need them. So yes, that should work perfectly. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for listening. <laughs>